so I will I will call us to order. Uh, this is the Elementary School Building uh, Sustainability Subcommittee. But today is Wednesday, uh, the 17th of May, 2023. Um, and uh, we're now in session. Um, so let's see if I can share this agenda real quick here so that people can see it. Are there too many things on my screen? Let's try that. That does not look right. Nope, that's a picture of a background. Excuse that. Uh, no, no, oh, we can I, see I can it. see it. Oh, you can? Okay, good. Because <laughs> it switched screens on me and everyone turned the little tiles off to the mm. side. Okay. I, I should apologize. I, I have a, a little bit of a of both allergies and a cold. So um, if I cough, I will try to mute myself before I cough, but okay. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we should probably do just the, the quickest, briefest uh, kind of reintroduction since it's been a little while since we met primarily with the design team and, and who's uh, uh, here today with us. Um, uh, and then jump into, uh, uh, you know, for the, which will be the first, first substantive item, which is going to be the review of changes due to code upgrades. Um, and so, then, and Jonathan, if you can just do the one since we're virtual, just call out. Oh yes, yes. Sorry. Just, you just call out the three of our names so we can yeah. say we're here. And uh, Kathy, I can hear you. I assume you can hear me. And yeah. Rupert, can you hear and be heard? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. indeed. Okay, <laughs> I found the mute button. Great. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I think I could probably minimize the the. Uh, Screen share for the moment so people can see each other a little better. Um, Tim, if I could ask you to just kind of introduce yourself and then have everyone else kind of introduce themselves real quick and what their role is. Uh, Tim Cooper with Finisco, just uh, we're all familiar, but um, Ale and her team is here uh, and I'll have them introduce themselves. And just uh, one second before that, we also have Kevin Murphy, our electrical engineer, and Jared Humphreys listening in. I'm oh, sorry, Ale. Yep, I'll just say hi, Alan Menchaca. Uh, you've seen me before, not under, I launched my practice just a few weeks ago. And so I'm still working on this project with TT, but under Airlet Studio, um, still on the same role. And I'm going to pass it on to Ermac. Hey, everyone. I'm Ermac Turan uh, with Lauren Thomas Eddy. I lead the Boston Sustainability Group. I'll pass it over to Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca Romlo, and I'm in the Boston Sustainability Office, um, focused on certifications work. Uh, Liam. My name is Lam. Uh, I work with Permac and Rebecca on the sustainability group. Great. Jonathan, um, I don't know if you can see, but um, Shelly may be in the audience. I oh. sent her the invite. If you're... <laughs> If you're able to promote her, that would be great. If not, not a big deal. She's, I don't see her yet. She's not there right now. Yeah. Okay. Great. No worries. So I'll, I'll try to keep that up and, and keep an eye out for it. Um, so with that briefest of introductions, Tim, do you want to kind of uh, start things off? Or are you going to go straight to the Thornton Tomasetti folks? Uh, well, uh, I believe Irma will be sharing her screen. So if she doesn't have the capability, please let her do that. And I will just kick it off by saying we are um, very excited to be moving into DD just to uh, state where we are. We submitted SD with the stated goals of being net zero and uh, a target EUI of uh, 25 that will allow us to uh, recoup the energy incentives that will help fund the project. Um, and then within the budget that was established at SD, um, with sustainability being a core value of the people of Amherst, uh, any other things that we can achieve within the uh, programmatic limits and the budget limits of the project. Um, so our next steps are to um, evaluate the project as it relates to the upgrade code upgrades um, and make sure that we're on target for that. And um, rather than uh, repeat the nuances of uh, what Ali and her team are going to say, I'll just hand it over to them to start. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, all right, let's get started. Um, so I'll kick it off and then I'll pass it on to the rest of the TT team. Uh, um, so we'll talk um, a little bit about our status just 
energy wise, just to get everyone on the same page. And then we'll uh, dive deeper in the code compliance and the novel performance. And then uh, Ermac and Rebecca will follow up with mass save and lead, lead updates as well. And so if we go to the next. Thank you. And so um, as a reminder, from an energy standpoint, there's two main goals uh, for the project. One of them is, is getting to net zero energy. Second is making sure that our EUI is below 25 in order we can meet the mass safe target. We definitely want to maximize lead energy points. And then, of course, this more than a goal is like a must. Well, all of them are musts, I guess. We need to meet the new Massachusetts stretch code. Um, and so we'll 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 spend most of our time talking about the stretch code today. Um, but did want to give an update if you go or Mac to the next one. Um, this is where we are in terms of energy. This is based on the SD model, and there will be a DD model uh, developed um, soon as DD evolves. Uh, and so some of you might have already seen these results from the report that we generated at the NSD. But basically, the project as it is, is currently at an EUI of 25. Um, we left the ECM of high performance glass just because, spoiler alert, we'll be recommending uh, better glass for, for, for code compliance. And so wanted to point out that um, there's uh, potential to lower the UI further. Um, we are right at the mass save um, requirement, UI requirement of 25. I would not worry too much about this. Um, this is Projects Evolve. Uh, the project is in good track uh, in terms of window to wall ratio, wall performance, et cetera, et cetera, really hitting, um, you know, dotting all the I's um, and through the process of um, making sure that we were compliant with code. There were a few more things that were incorporated into the design um, that will be updated into the DD model. And so we only anticipate this EUI going down as long as the design is, is, is in the good route a good sustainability route that it is right now. Um, and I do want to point out that there is any right now the math says that we need 768 me megawatt hours a year um, to achieve net zero energy. Um, and our understanding is that there are PV arrays that will be provided on roof and parking canopy that are actually exceeding that amount. And so we have a good cushion there for the moment. Um, and so we're hitting uh, those two goals, the mass save and, and the um, and the net zero, if we go to the next, then from a lead point standpoint, uh, you know, important to point out that with respect to a lead baseline, the energy cost reductions are of course significant. Um, and we are achieving 16 lead points, which is quite outstanding for a school. And so we're, we're doing great there. Uh, and so that really targets the first three bullets out of the four energy goals. <laughs> and then we'll go uh, in, the, in the code. Um, how many of you are, I just want to make sure because some of us have been in the many, many, many calls with DOER about code. And so I would say this team is, and I'm not, this is not an understatement. This is probably the most expert team on Teddy, which we'll talk about the compliance path in, in the state, um, definitely from a design standpoint, uh, but from the Amher side, have you heard about Teddy? You're well familiar with it. It's the first time you hear about it. I'd, I'd just love to know who, you know, how, how basic do I get or do we I, go I straight into that, the technical that, stuff? Yeah, I, I suspect that I, I'm probably the only one who uh, in the subcommittee that, that that knows what that term is, but I am okay. running it, uh, you know, as as I'm having to incorporate it into my practice. Yep. Um, so yes, having having an explanation of that and, yep. uh, and how it is, um, I might call it, might call it a seismic shift a little bit in, in how the uh, the code, the energy code in particular is um, kind of, uh, you know, exploring, <laughs> whatever the right yep. term is, yep. documenting mm -hmm. energy compliance. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. Great, perfect. Um, so we'll get started with that. Please feel free to ask as many questions as you want. Um, this is a, it, it can get, intricate quickly. And so definitely ask as many questions as you want about the project. And so just big picture, uh, Amherst is a stretch code community as of now, and the 10th edition stretch code will go into effect July 1st, 2023. That means that any project that goes for permitting after that time 
will need to comply with this new edition of the stretch code. There are many communities that are also opting into the specialized energy code, which effectively makes um, with a few other requirements just means that the building is on top of all the requirements need to be all electric, which this building already complies with. Um, if we go to the next. Uh, without getting in the, the entire 10th edition stretch code and whether you have a lab or a multifamily where you would fall, let's just focus on schools. And there are two paths available for schools right now. There is the Teddy path, um, which has been labeled targeted performance. And then there is Passive House. Uh, the preferred path for Fort River is Teddy. And the way Teddy was designed was to... Um, to as perform performance wise to have very similar goals to passive house in terms of infiltration envelope performance etc cetera, etc cetera, but without the entire pass pass certification process and so one would anticipate that both buildings are going to have somewhat similar levels of performance but one of them will have it somewhat of a more streamlined um you know certification free let's say um process um and so if we go to the next so what is Teddy? Big picture, there's two Teddies. Uh, most people are focused these days on heating Teddy, but there's also a cooling Teddy. What Teddy, Teddy stands for thermal energy demand intensity. Um, and what it really means, if you think about heating, is how many watts do I need to put into, say, a space or a building to keep that building at a given set point, period. Uh, how do I do that? doesn't matter, right? And so whether I do that with candles or I do that with the fanciest HVAC system, it does not matter. My Teddy is the same, it's the demand. The cooling Teddy is the same thing, is how many watts do I need to remove from a space in order to keep a space at a particular set point? If I do that by opening windows or by having a window AC unit or by having a sophisticated ground source heat pump, uh, from a Teddy standpoint, it doesn't matter. And so Teddy, even though it has uh, not very conveniently the same units as EUI because it's KBTU per square foot per year, it is not energy use per se, right? And so if you look at your EUI bar chart and look at the heating energy end use and the cooling energy end use, those are not equal to Teddy, but they're based on the principle. So Teddy is the demand, and then the energy we use to meet that demand is what reflects into that EUI. Um, if we go to the next, any questions here? And I, you can repeat, we, we, we as a team had to go over the Teddy definition several times uh, to understand it ourselves. And so if, please stop me at any point if you want some clarity around that again. Thank you, Armaka, we can go to the next. Or Rebecca, I forget who's running. So, I don't know who's running that. So um, can, can I ask yes. you a question? Yeah, about, absolutely. About Go ahead, Teddy. report. When you yes. say it's the demand, is it sort of looking yeah. at like peak loads factored nope, in somehow? it's annual. It's annual demand. So the peak load will be one of those data points. If yeah. you have a peak at a particular hour, that's counted. But it's basically the sum of all the heating watts that you need over the course of a year and the cooling watts that you need over the course of a year divided by square footage. Yeah, I, I guess it sounds a lot like EUI to me. <laughs> it, so let me walk you. No, no, it's very, very, very important that we get the difference, uh, that we understand the difference, okay? So if um, we had a, um, say, a boiler meeting our heating demand, right? And let's assume it's a perfect boiler with 100% efficiency. That's just for the sake of the watts that you need to put in will be equivalent to the watts that your boiler gives you, okay? If you use a ground source heat pump, which would give you a COP of let's say, or a heat chip chiller that gives you a COP of say five, then if you need, so I'm gonna put numbers to it. So if you need a thousand watt hours over the course of your year, your boiler will give you a thousand watt hours. So you will need to put, a thousand watt hours into your boiler so that you get your thousand watt hours in your space, right? Does that make sense? So, because it's 100% efficient. Whereas if I'm using a much more efficient system like a heat pump, a ground source heat pump, et cetera, 
that say uses a fifth of the energy to meet that demand, then I would only need 200 watt hours to put into that system and say an electricity, in this case, an electricity is an electricity in order to be able to provide those thousand watt hours into the space. So in effect, you're factoring in the efficiency of your system. So the efficiency is the connection between Teddy and EUI. Ah, and thank you. Thank you. That yes. helps a lot. Fabulous. Great. Uh, it's it's critical to understand that because the moment you ask me, well, how is the ground source heat pump affecting our Teddy? The answer is it isn't. It's helping you meet all of your other goals, but it really isn't doing anything for Teddy. And why did the state come up with that? We can talk about that, right? But that's Teddy is really just the demand itself. How you meet it again, you could have candles inside and just meet that demand with candles and your Teddy would be the same. Now, how, so how does the process change with respect to what you, case. yes, go ahead. I think Sean has a question. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I'm yeah, probably, sorry. I don't see that. Oh, yes. I just saw your, yeah. I'm probably the least um, knowledgeable person on the committee in this area, but. No problem. I guess I'm, I'm still confused on how um, you said it's the same, regardless of what type of system you have. Um, I, I guess yeah. that part's confusing me. I would feel like one system would be more efficient than the other. So it'd be different between the two. Um, mm -hmm. can you, can you go over that one more time? Yes. The same? Yes. And so what the Teddy, what the Teddy is looking at is the demand. And so how efficiently you meet that demand does not factor in to so when you the say demand, Teddy number. Meaning the, the systems and what they need to operate. It's the, it's the energy demand in the space. And okay. so if I need so many, so that would be like lights. Space to keep it warm. Would that be like, is that just heating and this cooling? Is, or is... We're just talking about heating okay. and cooling. And so the heating teddy is your heating demand and your cooling teddy is your cooling demand. So okay. let's assume you have um, a box, an experimental box. You have a box that is all sealed up and you have a bunch of light bulbs in there, right? And you want to keep it at a given set point, right? Let's assume that the temperature outside doesn't change. You have a thousand light bulbs and you need to keep that box at, 70 degrees, right? You have two options. You either just put in AC and plug it in and remove that amount of energy. You could also just say, punch a bunch of holes into the box and get to that temperature. The demand is still the same, but how you meet that demand is different. You could meet it with very different ways, very different systems. And so your systems to Rupert's question, your systems will define what efficiency you have, and that will directly translate into your EUI, right? But the number we're looking at is the base number of what is the demand that we're trying to meet. And I, again, I don't want to sound this too, is, too, I think it's too silly, but to, is it yes, relative no, to, ahead. so I assume that changes based on the temperature outside or and how far you have to that's heat right okay. so your teddy will change if you if you are in north carolina you're going to have a different heating teddy than if you're in alaska okay. your heating teddy will be higher in alaska than if you're in north carolina that is one um it will also change if you decide to change your set points right because you could decide to have your space at 75 and then you're going to need to heat more than if you decided to have it at 65 Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And so your Teddy will change with that. It will change with occupancy. Right. It will change with, you know, if you have lots of lights inside, then you're going to need less heating to heat that space than if you're really, you know, low on internal gains. Okay. Does that I, make I sense? Get, and the same, and I get the same it enough, applies, I think, to, to understand it. Yeah. Uh, and the same applies for cooling Teddy. Um, it's, it's the same logic. And the last thing I'll say, and I, and I see two hands raised, um, the heating, any strategy that we use to reduce the heating teddy. So for instance, if I want to reduce my heating teddy in my building, I could improve the windows, right? Go from double pane to triple pane, then I will need, a, I will have a lower heating demand. Um, any strategy that reduces my heating teddy kind of automatically increases my cooling teddy in a way, right? Because now you need to cool more when you are cooling more. And so the trick is to find the right balance so that we're, you know, within the thresholds and both. I see two hands raised. Please, uh, Kathy, go ahead. Okay. Um, my question is, um, to the extent I understand this measure yep. uh, or not, the state, had a, the state had a reason to adopt this. Is yes. this. And so if you could just say a little bit about why yeah. 
this because it's it's clearly confusing. Well, it's confusing. And you've also got Eversource over there giving us incentives based on an EUI, which yeah. has, as you said, they're not, it's not a one-to-one -one kind of and, and our bylaw is based on EUI too. And you know, our, so we, right. So we can't yeah. forget about EUI. <laughs> right. That's so right. you can't you can't forget about it, but but yeah. we've got so there's there must be something in the shift yes. that, that uh, is appealing to the energy folks, right? Yes. And um it is the thought that um there's a couple of things, but it's basically the state believes that invest investing in this really relates to massing an envelope. It's a metric that really, really um, uh, depends a lot on your envelope properties. And so envelopes say, you know, are there for a very long time and systems aren't necessarily. Systems will be replaced every 25 years, but your envelope might not be. And so the state is betting into having better envelopes to begin with. Uh, it prioritizing envelopes over systems. We could we could argue, I'm not representing the state and we could argue about whether we think that's the best way to go about it or not, but that is that is one of the reasons. The other reason is that reducing the demand has a direct impact on um, again, at a basic level on, the grid. And so this what the state has said is that they believe that focusing on demand as opposed to on EUI per se or energy use is a better strategy to to ensure that over a long term the energy demand of buildings is 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 low. Again, I'm presenting what the state has, you know, has used as 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 an argument. Um so can I just yeah, ask, Rupert, yeah. you have a question, but my follow-up would be, and yeah. you, don't, you don't need to answer this because this is a question of the state. Yeah. If they're putting that emphasis, then mm -hmm. the funding agency, MSBA, should put that emphasis on envelope yep. two um, because it's, it's asking people to put more money into the envelope. And I'm just thinking about watching what Europe is doing with buildings that were always built to last forever. Um, they can retrofit their energy systems more easily than we can because right. we have leaky buildings. To, you know, our envelopes are are crap. We don't have a good thing to start with. Um, yeah. So it's they they should coordinate across their funding agencies. Would be and my so and 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 they are well. I'm not sure coordination is the right is is, is the word, but uh, MSBA. Nice. We've had actually calls with Carl Brown at MSBA. Uh, and what we've actually been walking him through the Teddy process ourselves and uh, because they have been wondering how to best support this change. And so they're not necessarily in the same cycles and they don't necessarily have the same goals. MSBA has wondered, do we just throw, throw the lead requirements out the window? And I think there has been a resounding like don't do that because lead is actually focused on so much more than just energy that we do want to think about water. We do want to think about landscape. We do want to think about those things. And so MSBA is looking into it. It's just not a coordinated effort that is kicking off on the same date, if that makes sense. Rupert, on to you. All right. So maybe this is repetitive, but so, uh, just to see if I really understand you. Yeah. Um, uh, when you're looking at heating U EUI, I mean, heating Teddy, it's essentially 100% efficient electric heat. What is your demand? Right. And um, sorry about that. No uh, so, but for cooling Teddy, it's there's not a straight electric heat. It depends on the your baseline energy standard of how many it's, watts you're for cooling. Yeah, and so you're thinking about it. If 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 I hear you correctly, I think you're trying to think about well, how do I convert the the heating energy that I'm familiar with into Teddy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's easier with heating because we're kind of familiar with boilers, and boilers are kind of 100, so it almost equates to the same thing. Um, though with heat pumps, we're actually seeing that that isn't even you know with heat right. pumps, we're starting to see a third. And so with cooling. Is just if you think I like to think about a typical COP cooling COP of like four ish as a factor, and so anytime I'm looking at my energy use, my cooling energy use, say it's 10 kBTU per square foot per year, then my demand is probably around the 40, 
And so I had a demand of 40, but the cooling system only needs 10 to cool because it's using okay. the environment to, Thank you. to cool That's that. I, I feel a little bit more confident that I'm getting it. Thanks. Great. Yeah, and so the main factors, I should have been more explicit about the main factors that drive Teddy. And so I mentioned envelope a lot. And so envelope heat gains and losses are one factor, but also infiltration affects Teddy and also ventilation impacts Teddy because we're bringing outside air in and we are having to condition that air. And so that falls into the demand as well. Um, if, if that makes sense. And so, and so I think the, the, until now, if you're familiar to the process, you know, with the current process, current code process until now, we've been so far working with ASHRAE baselines. We're familiar with what our proposed building is, what percent better we need to be with respect to a baseline. And it's a percent better with respect to our, it's our own building, but we're converting our building into a baseline and then and then saying, what is our proposed building? The new process is an absolute number that is independent. There is no baseline anymore. The Teddy will have a number. And so we will need to meet a particular heating Teddy in KBTU per square foot per year and a particular cooling Teddy in KBTU per square foot per year. And just to walk you a little bit more through what that means, we go to the next. So this is the table for Teddy's. And if you will just ignore the equation, the noisy equation that's in the middle, um, you'll see that on the left, you see different uh, building occupancy types. And so you see schools right there highlighted in red. And basically our heating Teddy will need to be anywhere from 2.2 to 2.4. These are, I recognize brand new numbers. They were new numbers to us. And so we had to learn what two means and if two is high or low, but your school is going to have to be anywhere from 2.2 to 2.4. The actual number depends on the square footage of, of, of the project. And then for cooling, Teddy will need to be anywhere from 12, somewhere between 12 and 20, uh, a specific number it, you know, that we come up with, with with the square footage. And so if you have a really, really, really large school, uh, if we were talking about a project that is 200,000 square feet, then you would be looking at a 2.2 heating teddy threshold, a cooling teddy threshold of 12. If we were talking about a very small school of 50,000 square feet, say, then we would be looking at a 2.4 heating teddy and a cooling teddy of 20. And so it's an absolute number that we need to hit. If we go to the next. Now, uh, <laughs> those are the published targets. Um, you can imagine that it, starts to get really tricky if I am have to meet a very specific number that that other schools are going to have to meet as well then what about you know what if I, the school is being used in the summer versus not used in the summer or what if the set points are different between one school or the other etc cetera, etc cetera? well the state has thought about this and has issued draft modeling guidelines that basically tell us what rules do we need to follow in order to show compliance? And it's rules that the state has set so that they can also review and make sure that all school projects, say, are actually kind of making the same or similar assumptions so that they can compare apples to apples. Um, draft modeling guidelines were first published end of December. As far as I recall, was some fun Christmas reading. Uh, <laughs> then uh, they were, there was a lot of, lack of clarity let's say on a lot of the guidelines uh and we actually started doing teddy generous. modeling yeah. thank you um uh, we started doing a fair this again this was our first project and that we now know that this was the first project in the state where we actually took an actual project and not a sample project that the state used uh and try to get the teddy uh and we got it and we're like it's our teddies are definitely not meeting that threshold. Uh, what, but what are we missing? And so the modeling guidelines have been edited as we move along uh, in order to make sure that we are actually following exactly the same steps that the modelers who came up with those numbers were following. The final guidelines have not been published. They were supposed to be published first week of May. We're still waiting. And so everything that we'll present in a bit 
is with a big caveat that we actually haven't seen the final guidelines. Um, we have a sense of what they are because our projects has actually helped craft the updates on each one of these versions, right? And so suddenly they tell us you can't model this. And we say, well, for instance, we noticed that, and I think you, you should know about this because it's, it's important for you to understand that the Teddy model is gonna be this kind of abstract model that goes on the side of your actual model. Your actual model will be predicting EUI and will be predicting everything else, but the Teddy model is really just gonna be focused on compliance. Um, for instance, the Teddy model, the guidelines we're anticipating, we have been told by the state that this will be a requirement. Uh, the Teddy model will be modeled in Boston, Massachusetts and not in Amherst, right? And this is because we noticed that um, changing the weather file was actually changing the Teddies a lot, um, to your point, Sean. And so um, that is something that the state had not anticipated. And uh, so for mm -hmm. now, they're asking all projects to model their projects in Boston. And so your Teddy model, will be helpful. We will guide you through how to get to compliance and we'll get a compliant model. Um, don't try to dig too much into it or try to make too much sense out of it for your actual design. We will have a, an actual model that looks at EUI and looks at all the other things that we care about from the lead point standpoint, from the Eversource standpoint, and from a getting to net zero standpoint. We go to the next. And so the guidelines are unpublished. And so, um, I think I have outlined this enough, but just to remind you, there's certain things that are being kept the same as the proposed design, which is massing, window to wall ratio, thermal performance of the enclosure, air tightness, ventilation, heat recovery in particular. Um, and then different from your actual project is occupancy schedule, ventilation rate. Those are prescribed numbers. Uh, that go into the Teddy. And so again, really no point into getting into the Teddy model other than just we'll take care of letting you know if we're complying or not. And if we need to modify any of the blue, any of the factors in the blue to, to comply. We go to the next. So Teddy, just the heating Teddy, just as an example, if we have our basis of design and we improve the heat recovery eff efficiency, will reduce the Teddy. If we improve the wall, our value will improve the Teddy. If we change the glazing, we'll improve the Teddy. Uh, if we change the boiler to an air source heat pump, we won't be changing the Teddy because the demand is still the same, right? So our EUI would change for our Teddy wouldn't. Next, this is not our project. Um, I think I've set this enough. Let me see if I've missed anything. Um, uh, the Teddy thresholds are very challenging to meet. Uh, the numbers that the state put forward are lower than anything we've seen from other communities having a Teddy threshold. So Toronto has um, Teddy guidelines as well. So you need to do a Teddy model as well. And, and, and the thresholds are much looser. And so getting into the actual right heating Teddy and right cooling Teddy is not easy. Um, but if any project will has gotten to that already as this project. And so we're more confident about this project than any other project we're working on um, where we haven't gone through that process. Um, as I mentioned, you know, heating Teddy, whatever decreases the heating Teddy typically increases the cooling Teddy. And so again, we're trying to balance both so that they both fall within the threshold. Sometimes the changes that will impact the Teddy that will help us reduce the heating Teddy might actually increase our EUI. And so we, in our exercise, we have actually been tracking all of the different strategies to get to the Teddy to make sure that we are keeping our EUI in track. Um, and so we're working with tandem models again. Um, and again, the draft modeling guidelines at this moment, we're unclear and sometimes, sometimes misleading. We're really hoping that the final draft is much more direct and we kind of know what the final draft will look like, but haven't seen the actual final. Um, speaking about Fort River in specific, if we go to the next one, uh, our, these are the thresholds we need to meet. So heating Teddy 2.2, cooling Teddy 13.6. If we go to the next, um, the SD model as it was in December was not meeting the Teddy thresholds. Um, and that is what led us to talk to the state. At the beginning, we were really off. We were at heating Teddy of eight, just to give you a sense. And then we learned that there were many tricks to model things to then bring the Teddy down. 
Um, there are a couple of things from an envelope standpoint that do need to be fine-tuned from the SD model moving forward in order to meet the Teddy um, as we are right now. And so if we go to the next, those two things are um, upgrading the triple pane glass, which is also required for other envelope uh, upgrades that Rebecca and our Mike will talk about, um, and also inc increase the wall insulation to an effective R20. Um, the new code is much more stringent with envelope performance, and so now um, thermal bridging is accounted for much more, and so we are still working with the team to figure out what exact, you know, how much insulation do we need to add uh, in order to have an effective R20. Um, so we're working on that. Uh, but if we do that, the model as it is would be meeting both Teddy thresholds, as you can see, barely, right? Like we're barely fitting into the heating Teddy and the cooling Teddy, right? We're at 2.2 and 13.3, um, where our thresholds are 2.2 and 13.6, right? And so we will be working as the design moves along and uh, there are inevitable modifications to zoning and how do we, you know, spaces and everything, everything that just has to do with the design process. We will be updating and making sure that we are on track. If at some point we feel we are unreasonably not on track, um, we will reach out to the state just to talk to them and say, hey, we have a pretty good design. Why are we not meeting it? Um, we go to the next. And I think this is where I pass it on to Ermac or Rebecca. Before we move on, let's just quickly, I think there's a question from Rupert. So you said there were two paths. There was the Rupert, Teddy. can I interrupt you for just one sec? Like sure. literally I'm gonna mute for five seconds. <laughs> Jonathan. Um, yep. We might want to think of when, if we want to bring in some of the public. Um, yeah, I was thinking it might be good to 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 be a little looser, particularly since some of this is is, you know, a little <laughs> even for me, it, it's a little dense and it's it's a lot of new stuff to learn. So, yeah. um, why don't we start with Rupert and then see if there are some uh, first questions from from any of our attendees. Thanks. And Kevin, Sorry, real I'm, quick, just I'm a back. quick heads oh, yeah. up. Um, I saw Rupert Esley at 4.15. I can stay till about 4.30, but I have a soccer practice after that. Okay. Uh, so Thanks. I'm, I'm back. Sorry, it was the doctor uh, from the school calling twice, so I just wanted to make sure my kids were okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Everyone's fine. Thanks. Oh, good. Thanks, Allie. Um, uh, so you had said there were two paths. There's Teddy versus Passive House, and Teddy was the preferred yes. path. Can mm -hmm. you explain briefly why this nightmare is better than passive house. Why? Why what? Uh, why this is better? This yeah. path is better. Yeah. You know that is that's an interesting uh, question, and um, it's it's a conversation that we've had with uh, Denisco. There are almost no schools that have um, that are passive house um, in Massachusetts. We've actually worked on a couple of them. We, well, TT has worked on a couple of those. Um, the school path is still kind of uncharted. Um, there are a fair amount of soft costs associated to passive house certification um, that um, were at that moment felt like, um, you know, somewhat not necessarily the path that we might want to go with. Uh, Tim, I don't know if you want to say anything else. It's just, it's a more complicated process. Technically the state, I mean, what we've been trying to tell the state is if these two paths are meant to be similar in terms of performance, could, you know, could we make sure that Teddy is simpler? We have not gone through a simpler process to be clear, uh, but I think a lot of it has been the growing pains of this Teddy process, which in my personal opinion, wasn't very well hashed out before it was published. Um, I would anticipate that this process will be simpler for future projects, but I don't know, Tim, if you want to say anything else yeah. with regards to passive housing specific. Um, well, a couple of things. One, uh, the detailing um, is a bit more complicated in when you have to do it, uh, penetrations and walls, windows, which adds hard costs, but more importantly, um, in our discussions with the state of all the projects going on right now, all of the teams that have looked at this data and looked at the path, none of them have elected to go with passive house. 
so, you know, we, we, we are comfortable at our assessment uh, that this is the better path is it's going to bear out. Thank you. Can I um, introduce Shelly Potter? I, the TT team, I'm not sure that you've met her. She's a, a sustainability consultant who's on the OPM team. So Shelly, do you wanna, if you, I can't remember sure. if you've met all these folks, but I can see you have a question. So. I think I've, I've met most people, yeah. Um, so my follow-up question was just on the thermal bridging and how the Teddy process is dealing with that. And you, you know, the Passive House is a good segue into that. Is there therm modeling? Do they look at any of those details to help to figure out how to address that? Or is it not done in, in this particular route? Shelly, that's a great question. And I wonder, just not that I don't wanna answer your question, but we were about to get into envelope performance and go into the details of that. So um, this might be a great segue to talk about that. And if at the end of envelope performance, we haven't fully answered your question, we can, you know, come back to it. Does that make sense? Sounds good. Okay, great. Any any other questions? Kathy, can we see if there's any hands up in the participants? Yeah, so if we have anybody in the public who wants to be brought in to ask questions on this first thing, and then what we'll do is as they go through, make sure the committee members ask their questions first before we call on them. So I see one hand is up. Um, and if you want me to bring you in, put your hand up. And otherwise, we will still have a public comment period. OK. Kathy, I see Simone is in the in the waiting room, too. Yeah. And I asked Tim oh. by email, and he said it was OK to leave him there. <laughs> <laughs> but but if you would like to join Simone. <laughs> Bruce. OK. Um, Bruce. OK, so I just promoted Bruce and Rudy. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, about um, uh, air sealing. I noticed on a couple of slides back, uh, there were routes to uh, 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 satisfying Teddy and how you could uh, uh, move closer and closer to, to uh, compliance. And there were about four or five uh, columns, bar charts, and one of them at the end said, well, this is not. Uh, but I didn't see uh, um, um, air tightness in the uh, list. And yep. that's one of the important factors uh, going back through the whole of my life doing these kind of work. Um, does this, does Teddy set a standard or expect some kind of report on that? And if that's the case, then I guess we have to go back to Tim with questions from a, a year or two ago when we were talking about whether or not this project would receive some kind of formal uh, 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 air pressure testing. Bruce, yes, happy to happy to take that question. So the 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 little bars were really just an example of like how Teddy how Teddy does change versus it doesn't change with changing the HVAC. But you are completely right that air tightness is, and I probably should have stressed it more because it's one of the really really important factors. Um, air tightness definitely will impact Teddy, um, and so we'll the, the better the air tightness, the the you know the better the Teddy will be. Um, there are requirements now by code for buildings to be uh, to go through um, infiltration testing for blower door testing anyway. So that will have to happen. And the requirements for air tightness are actually this is one of the differences where 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 this is not as strict as passive house. Passive house has for anyone who's familiar with air tightness numbers about 0.08 if I recall correctly CFM per square foot at 75 pascals so 0.08 current code requires 0.4 and the new code requires 0.35 but it needs to be tested right uh, and so the building will need to be more airtight and that is just buildings will need to get more airtight by by design uh, and so there is a big component there of of making sure that we're designing for to meet to meet the performance. I hope that answered uh, your question, Bruce. Um, uh, yes, uh, but except that, um, are we going to be doing on-site testing? Tim's initial uh, answer to that question was no, 
and that it would be done by mock-ups and components and discrete um, diffractions. But this sounds like we'd have to up that game and do um, at least portions of the whole building, if not the whole building. Is that correct? The code changes have made what I said a year ago partially, if not totally, untrue. So <laughs> you are correct, Brooks. <laughs> okay, we're good. <laughs> Is there another question? Okay. Good. There, Rudy has a question. Rudy's hand is up. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Uh, can you hear me now? Um, uh, two quick questions. One, there was some uh, discussion. I, I don't know if this was a conversation I had with Jonathan some point back that um, it's possible the changes to Teddy were going to mean that sub slab insulation across the whole slab might be required and i wondered if that's the case to your assessment and the comment about our bylaw requiring uh, analysis of eui or using eui we actually my recollection i'm just skimmed through it again now we didn't actually use eui but i agree with jonathan that conceptually the local net zero bylaw requires that we look at the entire energy use of the building and not just heating and cooling demand. So I'm glad you're going to do parallel modeling because we'll have to um, demonstrate that the uh, PV that we put on is sufficient to uh, and capacity to uh, address the entire annual uh, projected needs of the building for everything, plug loads, lighting, and so forth, and not just heating and cooling. Yeah, and so I'll, I'll pick up that one at the end, but I fully agree with you. And I think it's one about, on a personal level. I think that it's one of the disappointments of the new code that some that the teams that are only looking to meet the Teddy might only ask for a Teddy model and just never really look at the energy use. There is, as I mentioned, there's certain, the Teddy can be reduced a lot, right? And so I'll, I'll get into your your underslab now uh, question. Uh, when we were desperate, we had a Teddy of eight when we started off. We were trying to figure out, can we just make the walls our 60 and the roof our 80 and get rid of all the windows and get to the two that way? Because we cannot, it, we just can't figure out how. And one of the, we were trying to equate the Fort River model to the models that had been published by DOER as examples. And uh, some of them had the under slab, the insulation uh, below the slab as one of the factors. And we thought, well, maybe this is one. And we found that that one actually had an impact on Teddy. It didn't bring us the value we needed. And that was in, in concert with the, you know, crazy R values on the walls and getting rid of the windows and all that. And so, that um, we learned that that tricks the, that 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 touches the teddy a little bit. It doesn't actually touch the EUI as much, as far as I recall. Um, and so we ended up in the process of working with DOER and telling them our model is actually is, we're just not meeting it. You're telling us we should be meeting it. We should be at two. We're at eight. We just don't know what to do. The lowest we could ever get it was five, actually. By by eliminating, by saying heat recovery is 100%, getting rid of all infiltration, like zero infiltration, et cetera, we just couldn't do it. And so then DOER came in, took our model and actually reviewed it. They, they, they paid someone to review our model and walk us through the discrepancies between what we had followed in the guidelines and what the guidelines should actually say <laughs> that we weren't following because the guidelines were misleading. And so they ended up changing our model to saying, well, actually you model, yes, we told you to model it this way, but you actually need to model it this way. No, we told you to do this, but you actually need to do that. And then the numbers started to go down. And so our assessment right now is that that insulation will not be needed to meet the Teddy. But we're, there still has to be a whole lot, another round of, of modeling and trade off. We have is an SD model. What we have <laughs> right. is an SD model. And so there's right. many things that we anticipate changing. We are hoping, again, this project has the eye of the state. And so I think that as long as we are following good design principles, that we will be able to comply because we're meeting the intent. <laughs> Great. 
Rudy, did you have a follow-up question or are you all set? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, let me, um, I, I should just add that my concern about subslab has never been just about heat loss and it has been a worry about uh, condensation um, issues and avoiding them. So I, I hope we will look at that again and maybe you all have, um, uh, um, but I'm, I'm glad to hear, or I'm not glad, but I'm, I'm glad you clarified that we will, sub slab insulation does not uh, get us the Teddy we want. There's other things instead. So thanks. So Allie, I think you can, <laughs> after that long delay, move on to your, your, your next section. Rudy, take your hand down too, just so we know you're finished. Unclick your hand. Thanks. Okay, great. I'm going to talk a little bit about the building envelope requirements. Um, so next slide. So um, there's a, a few things that we're keeping in mind with regard to the envelope, which I've listed here. Um, in IECC 2021, there is a thermal envelope certificate requirement. Um, the section we're going to primarily yeah. focus on on the, the following slides is are, are items that are related to section C402, which is in IECC 2021, as well as in the MA stretch code, which has some amendments, changes, and additions to um, those requirements. And then lastly, what we've just been talking about, which is the third-party air leakage compliance testing, um, which, as Ali mentioned, is refined in the MA stretch code um, amendments. So if we go to the next slide. Um, the way that we kind of think about the envelope is it's, it's kind of like a belt and suspenders to the, the Teddy modeling and the other modeling that we're doing. Um, and so there's sort of two different pathways to meet the code and the stretch code that we can follow as we understand it. Um, one is a prescriptive path, um, which has requirements for window uh, wall ratio getting under um, X percentage, which is 30 percent. Um, there's requirements as well that are added from the stretch code for derating of our wall assemblies um, that includes um, derating of the insulation. If there's insulation between the studs, it includes derating that's dependent on the kind of cladding system and how it's attached to the, the structure. Um, and it also includes derating for linear thermal bridges. Um, as opposed to the, the prescriptive path of a project is not meeting some of the prescriptive requirements. Um, it can instead follow an envelope backstop path, which is a full calculation that takes into account basically a weighted um, average of the U values um, for the above grade vertical assemblies, uh, which also takes into account all the derating of the wall assemblies that I just mentioned and the derating of the linear thermal bridges. So for the, for the prescriptive path, we're still taking those items into consideration. We're just trying to meet prescriptive maximum U values. Um, and, we, and I should say also that um, we have as recently as this morning been um, in communication with DOER to clarify some of those requirements, specifically as they relate to the linear thermal bridging for the prescriptive path in particular. All right, so next slide. So we've done an assessment preliminarily of both of those pathways, prescriptive, as well as done sort of an initial high level SD um, backstop calculation. And for this project, we, um, at the moment, think that the best path forward would be a prescriptive compliance path, which is what we're showing here. So this chart has um, three columns. The column here um, on the left side, well, the, the far left is talking about the different above grade vertical assemblies. So we have um, at the top our window to wall ratio, the opaque above grade assemblies, um, curtain wall, fixed windows, operable windows, and, and doors. So we're just kind of hitting the sort of the main, the main categories there. Um, and so if we go over to the right, we can see the current design derated whole assembly U value. And so when we say derated, what we're doing is we are first derating the vertical assemblies if we take an opaque wall assembly, for example. So we're first derating it based on the amount of insulation and the kind of framing that's in the wall. And there's guidelines in ASHRAE 90.1 Appendix A that tell us how to derate it depending on the different combination of structure <clears throat> and insulation that we have um, inside the studs and continuous insulation. 
We then um, derate it again for the stretch code according to the kind of cladding system and the attachments that are used for that cladding system. So if it's a brick veneer wall, which we have on this project, there's a certain way that we derate it based on the brick ties. If it's a rain screen system, which we also have on this project currently, we use a, a different value, it's called a psi value um, to derate it, um, which is given to us by the, <clears throat> excuse me, by the stretch code. Um, and so when I say derated, it's involving, the vertical assembly is involving those two steps of derating. Um, so the next column over are the code required derating um, maximum U values that we have to meet if we're following this prescriptive path. And then on the far left is what we're recommending. And so the first thing we did is we assessed the window to wall ratio and saw, okay, we're under the 30%, which is great. And so that's one of the reasons why we thought that the prescriptive path would be a good path to follow. And then we um, did all the derating for the current design to see where the U values were falling. And so in combination between trying to make sure that we're um, taking all of this rating into account that we're thinking ahead to um, planning for linear thermal bridging and making sure we have a little bit of a cushion and then also aligning it with the recommendations from the Teddy modeling. We've um, preliminarily come up with some recommendations that you can see in some cases exceed what would be required as the maximum um, for the prescriptive path, but is trying to get the design in line with the Teddy because the two are really working hand in hand. They're not separate efforts. So um, the 25% window to wall ratio that the design is at currently is great, it's still hitting prescriptive. So we're not recommending any changes there to the amount of glazing. Um, we are recommending considering improving the insulation slightly in the exterior walls to get it to that R19, R20 effective um, um, U value or, or our value, I should say, which is in line with the the Teddy modeling and sort of puts us a little bit in a in a safe zone um, away from the the maximum U value that we have to meet for the prescriptive path. Um, and then for the the glazing, if we were only looking at the envelope, we could have slightly poorer performing glazing. But again, as Ali demonstrated, we really have to be improving the glazing U value as well for the Teddy path. And so we're recommending, you know, just to be in line with Teddy that we improve the glazing there as well. Okay, any, any questions about any of that? Can I just ask quickly, when you're talking about improving the glazing, are you talking about improving it beyond what's in the schematic design estimate? Uh, improving the glazing is the alternate that was in the estimate. So it's not in the base estimate, but it was captured there. So okay. uh, exercising that option would, as you know, require either design contingency shrinking for something else within the project, but it, there is a number that was quantified in the schematic design estimate. Okay. Okay, so if we go to the next slide. So the section is definitely shorter than the uh, energy modeling section, but just a summary and some takeaways. So, um, as I had mentioned, as of this morning, we were in communication with DOER about the linear thermal bridging in particular, as it relates to the prescriptive path. The stretch code makes it more clear for the full backstop calculation, which we have um, already done and evaluated for some other projects that we have, but it's not as clear how we take the linear thermal bridging into account when we're looking at it um, for the prescriptive path. So we're trying to get some confirmation on that, but like I said, we've also been sort of side by side evaluating it in a backstop calculator for this project as well. And so we're just gonna sort of keep tracking it. And that's why there's a little bit sort of still unknown that needs to get refined as DOER um, establishes what their requirements are going to be for linear thermal bridging for the prescriptive path. Um, but good news is that we do think that the design can meet new code prescriptive requirements with minimal, although a we understand the cost associated with it, but sort of minimal updates, which would include, as we've talked about, the improved performance for the glazing to get to a U value of 0.25 in line with the Teddy requirements. Um, also potentially, and we'll keep evaluating it as the design progresses, but potentially adding 
one inch of closed cell spray foam insulation inside the metal studs could get us to that R19, R20 um, effective value at the walls um, or slightly better for some of the wall assemblies that um, have um, less thermal bridging through the entire wall assembly, like the rain screen systems. Um, we might also want to focus some of our attention on linear thermal bridging details. The one in particular that we would want to focus on um, first is the vertical wall to slab on grade transition. Um, so not necessarily huge changes, but just trying to refine that detail a little bit to try to um, eliminate some of the thermal bridging and improve the performance there, as well as looking at the other thermal bridging conditions. But that's the one in particular that, um, that we think is most important to focus on right now. Um, and then lastly, for rain screen wall assemblies, we are assuming that the fasteners have thermal breaks. There's some pretty specific specific requirements in the stretch code. And so we'll be working with Denisco just to make sure that the, the product that gets selected would be satisfying that. So that's the end of this section, but happy to answer any questions. We have a few. Uh, I saw Shelly's hand up first. Is there um, gonna be any consideration of instead of the one inch of closed cell spray foam doing one inch of poly ISO? on the exterior, it's rain screen anyway. I'm wondering cost-wise, you know, how those two would compare and um, it would certainly help with the thermal bridging of the metal studs. Is it, so I'm just wondering if there's been any consideration or if you're willing to look at that. Um, we have discussed that with TC about what, if, if it comes to that, what would be the best place to put it? There are some factors to consider, as you mentioned, the cost. Um, whether it's continuous insulation or not. Uh, also, um, as silly as this sounds, uh, an extra inch around the building adds up to a certain amount of area that we have to count in our MSBA calculation. So, um, you know, when we figure out what the actual effective R value that we have to have is we can, or we absolutely will make that determination to see what's best for the project. Thank you. Kathy? Um, so I, I think this question is interactive more with Tim's team. Um, you said these are cost increasing. Um, and uh, so is it, my question is um, cost increasing how much, you know, and where there are choices of we can get to this result in two different ways. Um, would be, be able to see them. And I have one place in mind in the site design where we could do cost decreasing. So just trying to think of the um, trade-offs, Tim, if we, we try to say we've got a budget and mm -hmm. what can we do within the budget without going into contingencies? Um, and I'm not sure if Sean's still on it, but I want to play the role on just trying to hold the line because you haven't even started to build yet. You know, I went, no. you know, <laughs> So I'm assuming that you can't oh. anticipate all the unanticipated, but um, so just uh, as you go, as we go through this, some of these, it sounds like we have to do it, you know, to meet the code. And so, you know, the estimate, the cost estimates is that end of June, just when do we get a sense of how much money? Okay. So um, the, the, there's a lot of parts to that question. I'm going to try to answer them as I remember them. Um, <laughs> The next cost estimate is at the end of DD, so that will be in September, which will make sure that we are on track. Um, and I should clarify, when I said contingency before, I meant design contingency, um, uh, not cost contingency that will, you know, make sure that we are on budget after the project is in construction, the design contingencies that is included to make up for things like this throughout the process. Um, and then Sean has certainly made it clear and no one on the design team will forget that when there are two options and they are equally functional, the one that is more cost effective, um, unless we have a really good reason is, is going to win. So, um, and then the absolute quantity, I don't know that I said this and I don't know if I remember, but I, the double pane um, alternate at SD, I believe, was in the neighborhood of $275,000 for the entire building plus markup. And this is triple pane, though. Triple pane. Going to triple pane, sorry. Okay. To, double okay. pane is the base. We would be moving to triple pane. Or there's an alternative uh, that costs a little bit less. So we want to consider that where the middle pane is uh, a film rather than a, a layer of glass. It performs just as well, uh, but costless. 
and, and I, we don't want to be cavalier about sounding like while well, we can use contingency again the the concept of design contingency through the design processes that study it's high as you learn more that number goes down and down as you find out more about what you need to do to achieve where you need to be so it's not taken lightly and there can be trade-offs between now and the dd estimate but there will be another reckoning and then another reckoning at 60 percent as well but using the design contingency for items like this um, is kind of why you've got a design contingency okay this is this is a natural part of the the evolution of a, of a project okay um, yeah. you know, I, thanks that's helpful what is our our next section here i think we've answered the questions at the moment yeah, we're or Mark, are we are we rebecca shall we move on yep okay great um and maybe just to note i think in response to just to make sure that we respond to Shelley's earlier question, um, the code envelope pathways do not necessarily need to be modeled in therm. There are there are methods of evaluating the um, effective U values without without therm modeling. So it's not it's not it, it is an option, but it's not necessary to to meet the code requirements. Yeah, and I think that that got answered as you showed how it was being derated in the prescriptive. So I'm good. Great. Thank you. Okay, the last thing we wanted to touch on very briefly, just um, because we know that it is it is of um, critical importance for the project is the post occupancy energy verification. This isn't. This is something that um, you know is just something we're keeping in mind as the project is moving forward. Um, the so the things to note just at, at this point is that you know submetering will be required for all the electrical end uses in the building. Um, those that are listed one through seven here on the slide, um, they'll need to be metered um, for a minimum of one year period and that's after the building has entered sort of regular occupation uh, or occupancy and um, additionally any non-electrical sources so anything that uses fossil fuels including generators must also be um, must also be uh, uh, the energy use must be recorded and reported um, but at a at a at a uh, less resolution than than the electrical energy usage, and this is something that um, you know as the project moves forward, particularly with the EverSource um, review, there will you know the the team will will make assurances that the the proper um, submetering is included to um, to meet these requirements. Any questions here? Margaret? Yeah, so I have a question. Um, I guess it was last week. Um, there was a presentation um, about the kitchen design. Um, it was, there wasn't, there weren't, it was a small group because it was mostly the kitchen consultant and the Danesco team presenting to the um, folks who run the kitchen at the yes, school. Yeah. And um, one thing that I was surprised at, um, which maybe indicates my level of disconnectedness from the details, is that he talked about using propane as a source for some of the kitchen equipment. Um, and it surprised me for two reasons. One was that I, in my mind, when I think about net zero, and I don't think of propane and net zero sort of being in the same uh, package. Margaret. Can I just clarify? He was talking yeah. about the refrigerant and the, he wasn't talking about the fuel source. He was talking about the refrigerant. 
they, okay. they actually use the propane as part of the refrigerant system. Got it. Okay. Works. Got it. Okay. So that answers my question. I'll put my hand down. Looks like Bruce has one. Yes, uh, I'm looking at this uh, submetering. And I thought Margaret was going to ask my question when she hit on kitchens and, and all of the uh, activity, energetic activity that happens in association with coolers and cooking and fans and makeup and all of that sort of stuff. But it seems to me that there's a fairly large uh, component of energy use in the uh, in that general area. Um, has there been consideration? Uh, I guess that would be taken to some degree under receptacle circuits, but... I mean, I, it seems to me that that's going to be a much bigger component than exterior lighting, for example, and one that's more changeable and uh, and, and might uh, benefit from having that kind of uh, um, data collection. Yeah, certainly. And I think so we generally so all we can say generally end uses, all end uses are, are metered to some degree. We'll review with, um, with uh, as, we, as we work with Eversource and also uh, with VAV to ensure that everything that needs metering will be, will be included too, because as you, as you say, it is a significant um, load or significant portion of the load. Thank you. If I could just jump in for a second, this is Kevin Murphy, I'm the electrical engineer. To answer that question, um, we also have to do metering per lead requirements. And so any load that matches a minimum of 10% of the building's load will also be metered. And with an all electric kitchen, the kitchen would be one of the areas where we would require meeting to meet the lead requirements outside of the mass save verification requirements. Great. Bruce, did you have a follow up or shall I move to Shelly? Just click your hand to be a good There you go. Shelly. Um, the, the one other thing I want to put on the radar here is if there's any sort of educational curriculum integration into metering that we would want to have that conversation early, just in terms of feedback loops and, and et cetera. So I just want to make sure that gets noted. I think Rupert is going to leave us soon. So before he does, I just want to check in with him and see if he had any last comments, questions. If I have his time schedule right. Uh, you do indeed. Uh, it's coming down to the wire. Thank you for asking. Um, no, I think I'm I'm getting the, the big picture, and I appreciate uh, everyone uh, everyone's patience in answering our questions uh, on the uh, design team. Thank you. And just just to assure you, Rupert, and anyone else who's listening, once this is presentation is done, I'll make sure we post it. You know, so that. Um, it, It'll go with the minute notes, but you'll also have as it's flashing by all the statistics. So, yeah. Great. So, if there aren't any more questions, and the last thing that we want to touch on is is lead, and just provide a uh, where we are with the lead status for the project. So, on that note, I will hand it back over to Rebecca. Great. Thank you. So, um, you know. Obviously, we'll keep refining the lead approach throughout design development, and um, we'll talk about next steps for that in just a moment. But our current status as of the end of SD is about 64 yes points, which are points that we anticipate are very probable or certainly um, going to be achieved for this project with eight points that we consider maybe likely. So you might notice that this scorecard has four columns instead of three. And we've, we've probably explained this before, but internally throughout the design process, we like to sort of split our, our maybe points into ones that are more likely to achieve and ones that are less likely to achieve so that we know where, where to really focus our, our energy from a design perspective. And so, um, what we, we typically assume is that throughout the design process, we'll be able to get about half of those maybe likely points. So that would bring our score up to about 68. Um, so 68 to 72 points that we think might be possible to achieve. So it really solidly puts us in lead gold territory. Um, but of course, again, we'll keep refining this and any points we can move into yes, we'll definitely be, be moving over. But we think the project's in really good shape as far as um, achieving lead gold. Any questions about lead? Nope. Okay. All right, great. 
Uh, one, Bruce, is there a question? Yes, it, it, it still amazes me that uh, with such a, a well-designed daylighting uh, effort on this building, and I know that that's true because we've been very uh, well uh, briefed on what you're doing and how you're going about it and everything, that uh, the not even one of those three daylight points is considered a maybe, uh, even a distant maybe. Um, is, is this, it seems to me as though this is saying something about the lead uh, system rather than the building, or, or is there some reason why you continue not to have any aspiration for collecting a daylighting point from the lead uh, uh, scorecard? Ali, I don't know if you could speak. To yes, that. that's spot on, Bruce. It has to do with how lead is defined. Um, classrooms are really deep. Um, and so the, the, the lead thresholds for daylighting were not, even though this, you know, this lead for schools, the, the, the thresholds were really not defined for, for, to be reasonable for a school. We really, none of the schools that we've ever worked on, uh, have ever gotten the daylight credits, even though we've made so much effort to get yeah. that. You would need skylights everywhere and just have to bring in daylight, you know, single single floor school that has skylights everywhere or something like that in order to get mm. uh, enough daylight in 30 feet deep. Mm. Um, and so the, the, the project will have the best daylight quality it can have given the massing and the program requirements, but mm. it's not enough for lead, unfortunately. Well, well, I guess I understand that. I, I asked the question because I did go to the uh, daylighting seminar that Margot Jones and uh, uh, um, uh, Lisa Heshong and and uh, 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 the other guy from LAM did. And uh, they they were struggling too, but they did manage to get one or two, I think, uh, on the garden and school. So I guess it's possible, but but I understand your answer. And, Thank you. And, and I can tell you, I have worked on schools that have uh, gotten closer and I would I, I wouldn't be able to be quoted on whether they actually got it or not, but those are schools that have a skylight above and have moved all the class, you know, that have actually changed the massing completely just for the purposes of daylighting. Okay, I, I'm I'm done with daylighting and lead. <laughs> And, and it's per, perhaps worth noting that we, we're continuing to evaluate the daylight as the project moves forward, and we will um, do a, a, another round of analysis to, to ensure that as the project evolves in DD, um, we're, we're still looking at how the daylight per, is performing in specific spaces in the building. Okay, we can move to the next slide. Okay, so uh, just highlighting some of the, the lead overlap requirements with the MSBA school, uh, Green Schools po uh, Program, excuse me, 2022 policy, which is the one that we're tracking for this project. So the requirements there, um, just a refresher, achieving lead certification, um, lead for schools, which we're doing great, um, aiming for golds. Um, well over the minimum of 60 points there. And then uh, there's also a requirement to earn a minimum total of three points from seven points that are available from the following three credits to have to do really with material health. So material ingredients, low emitting materials and indoor air quality assessment. And where we're, we're tracking right now is that we're tracking five out of seven possible points in those credits. And again, as the design evolves, we'll continue to evaluate where we can pick up even more. So we think we're doing great there as well, trying to meet the MSBA requirements. And then of course the requirement as well for um, for the optimized energy performance credit since we're optim um, getting all the points, 16 points for that credit. So we're doing great there as well. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So just to, we know that there was a lot of information presented today. And as noted earlier, we, we will share the slides so everyone has a chance to review these in, in more detail. Uh, but to summarize quickly what the next steps are as, as we move uh, through DD, um, we, will, um, we will be updating the energy model. So the SD energy model that we've been referring to will be updated um, 
in the coming weeks to both track where the project is standing in terms of EUI, um, as well as compliance with code um, which for the lead targets and the mass save targets. Um, and also we'll, we'll uh, engage with, with Eversource to, um, to further the, the mass save path one uh, requirements and move down that uh, process. Um, as mentioned, we are continuing to develop the envelope analysis to confirm compliance, um, looking at both the prescriptive and the envelope backstop um, approaches in order to meet that. And as we um, will we'll have more of an understanding as, as, that, uh, as that analysis moves along. And lastly, we will, of course, um, continue to track lead and update um, our lead status as, as anything um, evolves with the project. Are there any last questions that we can answer? Yeah. yeah, I have one that I'm not sure it's related to this. I, I thank you very much for all the pieces you've won through. Um, when you talked about monitoring and uh, various kinds of zones is, um, will come, TT, or is this more design team? Is there something simple that if we had it in the entryway of the school somewhere where the kids could see how much did we generate with the solar panels today? Um, you know, some simple graphic, you know, so, so we're in, think of the school, it's the building itself as an opportunity to be a teaching tool, um, a lived. So I don't, I don't know what that would look like. And I saw one example in a Northern Virginia school. So I don't know whether you've seen any schools that have done or Shelley has just something really simple. So I'm not talking about complex grids um, that that the staff could teach to or or and where where would we locate at them? So that's more in the building design. We've got some wall spaces that that would work if it was wired in a way to do it. Um, so that's a question, not really that related to the pieces you've done here. You know, how did we do to this month compared to a year ago or something? Yeah, over time. Um, I will just add that as we get into design, we will look at ways to connecting a display device to a and I have seen them. They can be as complicated or as simple as you want and program to be connected to the building management system. Uh, but that is certainly something that we will look at uh, with incorporating into the educational use um to rupert obviously um, um but we are not there yet in terms of proposing a system or uh what the how it will manifest itself but we certainly know that it's on the radar and we'll be looking at it in dd that's fine and, and this is a grade school so i'm not <clears throat> simple simple is what i had <laughs> yeah Timothy and Kathy, like I would just say, like it might be good to have a charrette that just is purely dealing with these educational sort of integration issues um, when the time comes, and so we don't it doesn't get kind of lost in the mix and be too late. And Kathy, the other thing you can do, you know, it it, it depends, but um, you can have wings competing against each other if you submeter the building properly. It really is a question for staff and how integrated they want to get, and you know. I think the information can always be simple enough that you know the students can understand, you know what's the net energy use, and um, really it's how you're going to use it, how you're going to integrate it. So I think that just needs to be a conversation. Thank you. I see Rupert. Rupert's still here. I thought he's his hands up. Oh no, it's Rudy. It's Rudy. Sorry. Oh, uh, hi. Thanks. Quick question on the mass save verification of the EV charging. If the EV charging was uh, done by a third party and metered separately as a separate business, um, separate from our school meter, would that not get counted against our EUI for, or has that issue come up uh, for the school performance for mass save purposes? That's a great question. We will, uh, we can look into that and confirm. Because that's one issue. I don't think we've really talked through in, in the course of either the bylaw or the um, the school building, 
you know, planning for the, the, the car charging aspect of this and, and whether that gets counted on or off budget, um, depending on how we do it. So might be important if we're close and it's going to affect our subsidy. I, I think we, we should take a look at that. Sure. Is there a dedicated number? Dedicated isn't the right word. Is there a, a you know, prescriptive number of EV charging stations that we have to provide as part of this project to meet the current code or the new code? There yeah. is a, oh, go ahead. I don't know if it, <laughs> no, I was probably going to say what you were, that there is a requirement for yes. the lead credit. Oh, okay. The, the, the stretch code also touches on EV ready, but uh, not specific spaces. Okay. And to be uh, clear, uh, to really to just uh, make sure that this is you know understood, but right now EV charging is not counted towards the EUI that we've presented, um, and so we're not. It's it's a valid question, but it, and it's not currently being accounted. And so yes, that would that would need to be added if that were a requirement. But do you know how mass save is going to count it? I guess that's no, no, no. So we'll be asking, no, but it, oh. we'll, we'll be asking. But just to be clear, right now, it's not that 25 not, does not count for yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Again, this is Kevin Murphy, electrical engineer, just to jump in. Typically, the, the PV will also be a separately metered with, with Eversource. It'll be a combined metering for the site. But due to the size of the system we're proposing here, Eversource doesn't usually allow it to be what we call behind the meter metering that would allow it to be as part of your bill. So you, they would be two meters that they would combine into one into one invoice back to the to the um, to the town. And the same probably would be with the EV charging that it's separately metered because you probably would outsource it to a third party to maintain it and run it and they would be responsible for collecting fees on charging is how it's typically done, but certainly many things to discuss as design continues through. Let's come back to that later, Rudy. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I think then we have come to the end of the, of the presentation by the design team. I didn't, don't know of any other uh, matters that weren't anticipated 48 hours ago. Um, I will offer a final kind of public comment period. Rudy, do you have another question or is that hand still up? Sorry, I looked away for a moment. This, this just reminded me, a friend of mine who's working on a school in Orange, uh, I don't know where they're at in the process and they're trying to do it net zero or highly energy efficient. They've had uh, issues with the utility in terms of the long negotiation period for the, um, I forget the name of the document, where it's basically the agreement with the utility about the, uh, the solar in interchange and uh, the whatever you know, transformers are going to be needed for the school. And it made me think about uh, how much lead time may be required to work through the details with the utility of this larger project. I hope that's already underway. And if it's not, I hope we begin to explore that soon, the interoperability agreement or whatever it is. Um, maybe you guys are already on that case. And, um, but I know that they require engineering studies for that can sometimes take quite a while and stuff if, if depending on where we are in their grid layout. So I hope we're starting that train soon. Thanks. Uh, I was just since we're making comments, I would say that we have solar design associates on the team, and that is well within our radar, and that process will begin well before um, the building goes out to bid before the construction documents are done. It's, it's imminent to, to begin that process. Kathy, I think we've, I think Maria's got her hand up. I'm not sure how to do the promotion. I can do it. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Okay, Maria, I've allowed you to talk. It, I, yeah, I think I think you can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, 
uh, just a, a quick request. I, I just checked the packet. Could you guys pop your slides into that? Because I'd like to report on the meeting just to make sure that the public is aware of what's going on. Um, and the slide deck would be really helpful to have to, to reference. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Any last call for any public comment? Maria, I'm just assuming your hand's still up from before. Or do you have no another question? Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, with that, unless uh, Kathy, there's anything else? No, I think I, think, yeah. I just want. I thought this was terrific. By the way, team, it was complicated issues presented in a way that some of us could almost understand. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you. And with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, see you. Thank you, thank goodbye. You. Thank you. Thank you.